So as we said, because man is intelligent, he cannot accept something that just he sees, but he wants to know it. A mere perception of a thing is not sufficient. He inquires into it. He wants to grapple that idea with his knowledge. And therefore, he starts inquiry. And all inquiries of the intellect is a chain of inquiry on cause effect relationship. Thus, the whole universe must have a cause. Applying the first law, effect cannot be without a cause. There is the effect and we are seeing the whole universe around me. It must have a cause. What that cause is, we don't know at this moment. That cause of the universe is called G-O-D in all scriptures of the world. In philosophy, it is called reality or truth. So God or reality or truth, as expounded in all the scriptures of the world, the Father in heaven, or Sri Buddha's state of consciousness, or Allah, or Atman, the Brahman, the Self, all these are different names to one and the same state of consciousness. This is present in every one of us. We are alive at this moment. There is no living being who is not, a living human being who is not conscious that he is alive. But when you inquire, what is that life? All that we can say is only the various expressions of life, but we don't know what life is. What is electricity, if I ask? And you try to explain to me that it is light in the bulb, the heat in the heater, the sound in the radio. If you say, these are all manifestations, expressions of electricity. Electricity is something other than all these. <coughs> in the same way, life is not my movement my physical efficiency, or my mental glory or beauty, or my intellectual accomplishment, brilliancy. These are all expressions of life. What is life? We know it is with us, but we don't know what it is. It is a theme of our investigation, our inquiry. When does there is a factor which we know is there but we don't know at this moment in order to help us to consistently search for it, we generally assume that let that unknown thing be X in arithmetics. Gamma or beta or theta in science. By assuming that sound it is only a representation. In itself, it is nothing. It is the unknown. Similarly, in philosophy, in the science, subjective science, they said, this spark of existence in you, this spring of consciousness in us, this touch of life in all living beings, let us call it as O. Oh, it's a sound symbol. What is that home is what we are searching. Now, when you don't know what you are suffering from, the doctors start observing the symptoms, symptomatic treatment, because we don't know what is the spring of that disease. In the same way, when I can't directly know this great truth, 
with all my faculties that are available to me at this moment, I start study of it in terms of the, its expressions. Life in me expresses, or life in the whole world expresses through three equipments of life. We are deliberately using the word equipment because you are familiar with electrical equipments, contrivances through which when electricity passes, <coughs> we see its manifestation, work done, and that is called a equipment. There are three equipment. Equipment has no plural. So you don't say three equipments, though to make others understand I used to do it, but it is against a grammar. <coughs> Just as dear has no plural, you don't say dears, but all that we say is a team of dear, a host of dear, not dear has no plural. Similarly, we have no plural for equipment. The three equipments, there is no plural. The three equipments, because if I don't use it, you feel uh, funny. <laughs> the three equipments are the body, the mind, and the intellect. Sharira mana buddhi are the upadhi through which life expresses in this whole world. In the mineral world, it has got a body only, a shape, a form. In the plant kingdom, when the stone or the soil has become a little more evolved into a plant, the plant has got a form, body, and the beginnings of the mind. It is able to respond to sunlight and water vapor. Nothing more. At latest now, oh yes, discovery is that they respond to a certain kind of music stringed instrument. I have no objection. Let them. Think. The beginnings of the mind. When that uh, plant kingdom evolves to be an animal, it has got a form body and a fully developed mind. Fully developed mind. And the animals function as ordered by the instincts and the impulses of the human, of the mind. <coughs> it is only in human beings, we have got not only the body, not only a form and shape, but a fully developed mind of the animal, Plus, a subtle instrument of discriminative thinking capacity to rationalize and think properly, creatively. This ability is called the intellect. We have, all of us have got all the animal instincts and impulses. You come into a, jump into a conclusion and act on it. Every one of us do. I, when he said that, I got so angry, I don't remember anything. <clears throat> and such an individual behaves like any other animal, barking and biting and fighting. But an intelligent man, 
even though he also has got all the animal instincts and impulses, he starts criticizing, critically viewing his own impulses rising, and he starts judging it. Is it right? Is it wrong? Is it, uh, will it bring happiness to me? Will it bring unhappiness to others? And when I find that a certain instinct and impulse that comes to me is creating sorrow to others, I give it a deflection, I give it a new direction and make it more creative. Disability the animal has not got. Only human beings have got. So to act permissive, whatever I felt I did it, that is not freedom, that is licentiousness. Freedom is the freedom in me to say no to myself of things that I understand to be wrong. This ability of discriminative thinking that you have got, and that is why man is progressing. Animals are still in that very same state. At the time of Adam and Eve, if the bees have built the beehive, so beautifully made, even an ordinary architect cannot create such beautiful structured cell as a beehive. And yet, even today, the same blueprint. They have not changed it. They have not put a drawing room in front. A candeliver, a, what do you call that? A porch in front so that during rainy season, they can come under the porch, dry up, and then go in. <laughs> they have never thought of it. A candelabra, they have made it. Whatever that was there at that time, nature had made them do it. Even today, under the impulse of nature, no freedom at all. They go on. Even their sex life is ordered by nature. A certain season where the birds and the animals feel the sex urge. Freedom is not for them. But with the intellect developed, the sophisticated creature called man, he has got all the freedom, he can use his own discrimination to do or to commit or to omit. He has got the freedom to do or not to do, or do it otherwise. All these abilities are in you, and therefore the progress, the material scientific progress. So the body with the sense organs, the mind with its emotions, instincts and impulses, and the intellect with its rational thinking capacity. Now, the body, the mind, the intellect are made up of matter. Calcium, carbon, phosphorus. M grosser matter, the gross body. Subtler matter is the mind and intellect. Matter is, whether gross or subtle, is inert and insentient. You and I are dynamic and conscious. Where does it get it? The parts of the car are all inert matter. And it moves. What make the car move? What make the bulb grow? There must be something other than the bulb expressing through the bulb. In the same way. What is it that is enlivening me? 
And a time comes when I have no capacities. My efficiency gone, my beauty of emotions gone, my brilliancy of intellect gone, even Einstein stops all thinking. The body is there lying down. But he has no faculties, abilities, capacities. Why? Life is no more expressing through it. Carefully. Thus, my friends, there must be something other than matter, the BMI, to enliven the BMI. That is why in your Bible it said, God is in the heart of all in living everything. Vitalizing everything. Lending their faculties to them by his grace. Just as the bulb has got light with the grace of electricity, the heater has got heat with the grace of electricity. You and I are today functioning as we are due to the grace of something other than matter. Since it is something other than matter, it is called the spirit. In the spiritual center of the spark of existence or consciousness, which is one in everyone, just as electricity is one, the bulbs are different, the radios are different, the computers are different, equipments are different, but the electricity is one. Cars are different, Japanese cars or American cars or European cars, but petrol, the gas is one the same. Love is one, plant, animal and human. Enlivens everyone according to the equipments available. And that one reality is indicated by the sound symbol OM. So the consciousness or OM, when expressing through the sense organs, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, skin of your body, There crystallizes a sense of conscious individuality. I, the perceiver, perceiving with the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, skin, what the sense objects. I am seeing, I am hearing, I am smelling, I am tasting. How do you see? How is it so simple? With the eyes I see. Uh, eyes cannot see. If eyes could see by itself, every one of us would have had only one eye. Because we would have kept one eye in the office. To have an eye on the office. <laughs> and very many of you, not in the office, but you keep it at home to have an eye <laughs> upon my people at home. Yeah. The eyes, if I remove and keep it on the table, the eyes cannot see. The eyeball is a yes. And today in the modern world, it's not very difficult for you to understand, as in good old days, because we are doing transplant. So I die, but my eyes are young, and they can take my eyes and give it to a born blind man, he starts seeing through my dead eyes. Ay, ay. So it is not the eyes that are seeing, it is the consciousness behind the eyes, become conscious of what the eyes are seeing. And then I say, I see, I hear, I smell, I taste. But all of them I mean, I am conscious of what I am seeing, I am conscious of what I am hearing, I am conscious of the taste, conscious of the smell. The consciousness behind enlivens and not knowing, 
I become Mr. Perceiva. The seer, the hearer, the smeller, the taster, the toucher. Similarly, consciousness functioning through the mind becomes the conscious psychological me, the feeler I, feeling with the mind various emotions. Love, hatredness, jealousy, greed, passion, oh, endless varieties. The same consciousness functioning through the intellect expresses as the conscious thinker I and the thinker I with my intellect thinks the world of thoughts. Thus the world of objects the field of emotions and the realms of thought are the fields from which I gather my experiences with the sense organs, the body, the mind and the intellect. So BMI are the equipments of my experiences. OET it represents the fields of my experiences. And I, the experiencer, the individualized conscious ego is PFT. It is not that I am seeing with my eyes, then you become a perceiver. But the moment you understand that I am seeing through my eyes, you become independent. Is it not? <laughs> through, you are standing in your drawing room, you are seeing the moon rise. Now the question is, who is seeing the moon rise? Simple, Swamiji. The window is seeing the moon rise. Why? If there is no window, will you see the moon? Huh? So, the window is seeing the moon rise or are you seeing the moon through the window? So, are you not you who is in you, who is using these equipments to experience the outer world? Thus, I, the consciousness, <coughs> in the eyes become the seer, in the ears become the hearer, in the nose the smeller, in the tongue the taster, in the skin the toucher, in the mind the feeler, in the intellect the thinker. Alas! In an unholy combination of you have forgotten who you are and unholy combination identified with the body, mind and intellect, you say that I am the perceiver, the filler, the thinker. And it is this PFT who wants private interview for the sorrows of his life. Think. So then, the PFT is the individualized ego, the jiva, the sufferer and enjoyer of the world. The BMI are the instruments of experiences. OET is the total field of experience. Nobody in the world has got any equipment other than the three. Nobody, rich or poor, healthy or unhealthy, developed a nation or not a developed a nation or underdeveloped a nation or never developing nation. Nobody has any other field from which to gather their experiences. The world of objects, emotions and thoughts are the only world from which they can harvest their experiences, collect their experiences. 
all through life. From birth to death, every moment you are having experiences. The experience is you. Therefore, we go to another man and say that I am experiencing unhappiness. Identified with the happy or unhappy emotion. I don't understand what you are talking, Swamiji. Or I am smart in misunderstanding, Swamiji. That is your intellectual. See? I am healthy or unhealthy. I have no home. I have no wife. At the physical level. Thus the physical, the psychological and the intellectual personality in you all put together is called Mr. Ego, the hero of your autobiography. <laughs> See? If you write your autobiography, who is the hero? I. Who is this I? Samaji, <laughs> I. I. Analyze it. This experience of. <laughs> now. Having thus discovered it, when the teachers looked out through the windows, these great rishis looked out, having understood the mechanism of life, when you looked out, they found that every PFT, all through their life, in every experience, is trying to discover a total happiness, complete satisfaction, total contentment from OET through BMI. This is your autobiography. Everyone, irrespective of whether you are a congenital idiot or a great genius, spiritual or materialistic, have or have not, every individual, nay, not only man, unconsciously, the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom also is searching and seeking for its own happiness. And what he wants is permanent happiness. Though thus the individualized ego is demanding a permanent happiness, it doesn't know where it lies. And all that is available is only the OET. And therefore each individual strive to hug as much of OET as possible in order to get a permanent happiness. But they forget that it is never permanent. Because all these are conditioned by time. Nothing is permanent. Einstein discovered it in the 20th century that time and space are the quantum in which alone the plurality can exist in the function. This is the latest Western discovery. In the Vedic period, our masters have said that this is all time-bound, kalabandhita, and time is constantly changing. And therefore, everything that is conditioned and floating in time must also keep on changing. Is not your body constantly changing? Nobody need be a philosopher to know it. None of you were born from the mother's womb on this size that you are now. You have been growing. Childhood, youth, middle age, old age, it goes on. Is not your mind changing? Things you loved five years ago, today you hate as poison. Things you hated three years ago, today you feel a kind of tenderness and love. Don't people divorce five years ago and then remarry that same woman? After five years? Hey, your mind changes. Your faith, your belief, your ideas, your ideology is not intellectually you are changing. 
I am not talking of those who are educating themselves and study. Even if you don't study. It is not the hammerings of the world outside make you change your values. So the body, the mind, the intellect are changing. The world outside, are they not changing? Are not the objects constantly changing in their arrangements? Are not emotions that you receive from others constantly changing? <laughs> Don't you generally say that so and so and me, we were such friends, I tell you, Swamiji, it is one soul in two bodies. We were together like brothers. Uh, today he hates me. Last four years we lived like brothers and today he hates me. It is his fault that he discovered you only four years it took for him to discover <laughs> that you don't deserve it. That we never think of it. That change. The emotions that you receive. At one place you get applause, at another place I mean, uh, discouragement or what do you call that? Uh, um, 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 criticism. Three women who are working here, they felt very bad that I am uh, against all women in my talks. <laughs> See, Krishna in discussing that the four types of human being, he is a rascal, he should not have said like that. Well, that didn't matter. Hey, this is all human frailty. We have to only smile, not feel unhappy about it or angry about it. That is how they understand. These discourses, that dog was constantly lying down and listening. What has he understood? <laughs> hey, he has not even the intelligence to misunderstand. And two, three, those, those girls and ladies are trying to go away from the ashram. It's better that they go because they are wasting their time here. This is not meant for blind faith. It is a highly intellectual field for thinking. Uh, so why, why I was saying was the emotions change. The intellectual concepts change. I was a communist. Now we're capitalist. Because I found that there's a lot of money in drugs. Become capitalist. Is it not changing people changing? Capitalists are they not becoming communists and socialists? In I mean in politics, in philosophy. I had no faith at all. Now I have discovered faith. Is it not? Even some of the greatest saints in the world were atheists before, but they changed their attitude because their intellect changed. That's my friend. All the VMI are constantly changing. OET is constantly changing. Between these two changing factors, you stupidly come to believe that a certain condition can be created in my mind that permanently peaceful, serene, nothing will happen to me. When, when I got some money in the bank. <coughs> hey, everybody. So then the great Rishi said, I can understand the animals and the mineral world, the plant kingdom feeling that way. You man who has got capacity to think why don't you analyze and understand that these nothing is permanent in this realm of time. Everything is changing. Play with the change. Just as in the dance hall, you enjoy the dance. Why? It is constant movement. Dance is not standing even. Time to move. So she, she steps on you and you <laughs> step on her. Enjoy! But nobody will fall down because each is hanging on to the other. Similarly, hang on to the world outside. Get crushed, never mind. Enjoy it. In a sport, in a game, don't you think you are 
panting, you are getting exhausted, and yet you say that ah, ah, I enjoyed beautiful game, ah, 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 beautiful game. You physically suffer, but mentally you enjoy. Why? It is a sport. It is a game. I wanted it. In the same way, enter the world, live through the joys and sorrows of life, but consider it as a sport. Why? You are not expecting anything permanent here. I knew that every, nothing is permanent. My husband is not permanent, my wife is not permanent, my children are not permanent, my business is not permanent. Nothing is permanent. But when it is there, I play. When it is not there, I play. Just because I am losing, is there a sportsman who has never continued the sport? So when I lose, I say that. Beautiful stroke. Ah, nice. And in case I win, I say, better luck next time. <laughs> Today you are not in your mood. I know you will always beat me down, but better luck next time. This is called sportsmanship. So sometimes I win, sometimes I lose. Why well, are you worried? Unless you are loose somewhere else. <laughs> Play the game till the end. Say the, the great Rishi said, why is it that these people, man, suffering until because of his ignorance? He refuses to make use of his intellectual capacity to analyze. He is very good in analyzing the outer world. Science, he progresses, but when he turns upon himself, he feels unhappy. And incapacitated, as it were. He never turns his attention to it. Vimudha nanu pasyandi. Visheshena mudha. Supreme idiots never understand this great truth. Gita says, Supreme idiot means not that you are incapable of wisdom, but you refuse to think. What can you do? You are so preoccupied with the world of. I mean, seeking a permanent happiness amidst the impermanent things, so fully engaged that your not attention cannot be turned away. Uh -uh. When they have thus understood it, they realized that so long as I am identified with the body, mind, and intellect, I am in that realm of time, change. So if I want a changeless state of bliss and happiness, I must go beyond the change. Beyond change means beyond the time. Oh, I see. And go beyond BMI, you realize the timeless, the permanent, the eternal, the immutable, the blissful. Uh -huh. Okay, Swamiji, this Sunday, now today I have got office. This weekend I'm going to meditate and go beyond the BMI <laughs> and realize the Brahman. And Monday onwards I will tell you all about Brahman. <laughs> this weekend I am visiting Brahman. <laughs> and you enthusiastically declare to the family <coughs> that look, tomorrow Sunday see that the children go out and play. And you also keep quiet. Don't break saucers and plates and make noises here. Not even the bathroom flush should be worked. I am going to meditate. So the poor wife thinks that this is a new trick. <laughs> and your early morning onward children have started asking you, Papa? When are you meditating? <laughs> Not now. After breakfast. Or else you know that breakfast idea will disturb me. So you take breakfast, everybody gives breakfast, and everybody has got a strange look on their eyes, <laughs> looking at you that you are going to meditate. No, I don't know what is meditation, you don't know, but... And you enter. <coughs> Children have been sent to the neighbor's house. There they may suffer. <laughs> you are all right. 
and then when you are entering the room also, you told the wife. And the wife also. She doesn't want to sit down because the, the, the cushions may make a noise. You go into the room, lock the room. What are you going to do? Go beyond the BMI. In pure meditation. You sit down. And you have heard that the great mantra is Hari Om. And you have chanted, started chanting in your mind. Hari Om, Hari Om, Hari Om. Then the body said, Hi, it is too hard. <laughs> <laughs> so immediately I said, okay, I got up. The seat is not all right. So put a cushion there. And in the cushion you sat down. And again, hurry on, hurry on, hurry on. Then your skin told you, I think it is too hot. And you said, yes, it is hot. So you got up, put on the fan, the ceiling fan, and you are sitting there. Hari Om, Hari Om. <laughs> Suddenly the skin said, it is too fast. <laughs> so you got up, slowed it down, sat down. Hari Om, Hari Om, Hari Om. Then it is that the vertebral column is saying that if there is a cushion behind, <laughs> it will be nice. So you get up and get a cushion and for to support your back. Again you sit down. How do you, how do you, look, you are a slave to all the demands. That is the point. So long as you are a slave, you will not be allowed to go out. Why? Because the BMI can no longer persecute you. <laughs> you are trying to become master of them. They are now today masters in you. They don't want to give up their chairs. Hari Om, Hari Om, Hari Om. I think there is coffee decoction in the kitchen. <laughs> and that woman is so careless that she will throw it away in the wash basin. <laughs> One cup of hot coffee and then meditate. Ha, how nice. <laughs> you get up, you open the door and the lady is worried. Now what is coming out? <laughs> it must be God himself coming out. No, nothing. And you make directly to the kitchen. <laughs> Think of the situation. <laughs> so she comes behind. Seva bhav. <laughs> what do you want, honey? I will give you... No, no, no I just... I don't want anything. Eh? But I thought that if there is decoction there, you know, then don't throw it away. Nowadays, the prices are very high. <laughs> a cup of coffee, you go inside. Do you think that you can... The more you try to meditate, the more the mind will persecute. At this moment, even though I am allowed to say that this body, mind and intellect are mine, Honestly speaking, I belong to them. I'm an utter slave. The local constitution may give you all the freedom. It's the freedom of the slaves. None of us is free. All of us are utter silent slaves, hapless slaves, miserable slaves to our own physical, mental, and intellectual persecution. See? If one's a mind has to turn, I say, yeah, You cannot, the, it is not possible for us to stand apart. We are whipped by the BMI. I am a diabetic. I'm not allowed to eat sweets which I love. <coughs> People invite me for bhiksha. 
and Indian bhiksha means a feast and in the feast in India unless there are three or four types of sweets it is not a feast they invite me everybody is in uh, taking their own food buffet and that was the Swami's special table everything is kept here because we don't know what the Swami would need, so everything is good. As I am going nearer the table, I see three beautiful, enchanting sweets, homemade sweets. Ayya. My body says, Swami, PFT, there is beautiful sweets. This is the time. These people don't know. They have presented to you. Eat. This is a charge. No, I says, okay, we will do it. Let us finish the other part of the food and then the sweet in the last, so that this will linger in your mind. <laughs> Only Gujaratis can take sweets in between to remind them that there is sweet in the world. We want to take it last so that it can linger it in you. <laughs> and you start taking things. And everybody is trying to put something in your plate and therefore your attention must be there or else you will be drowned in food. <laughs> so then you are there at that time. And after finishing it last item when it comes, you look at that beautiful sacred place on your left where the sweets were, all of them have disappeared. <laughs> Why? Even though the host doesn't know that I should not take sweets, the useless ones that come with me, they are called the devotees. <laughs> they to save the Swami, they take it away. Supposing they are there. And the body says, come on, now at least. I lift it. My mind says, don't, don't, don't. And the intellect repeats to me, which all the doctors, specialists all over the world has again and again repeated to me that this is the most beautiful disease that a man can get because there will be no pain at all. But slowly, slowly it destroys all your organs one by one and thereafter a time would come when liver is not working and if liver is not working then the kidney fails, the kidney fails, then the pancreas, the pancreas is long ago gone and then slowly, slowly, yeah, Kidney fails, therefore liquid water in you is not going and therefore it will flood in your own lungs and until at last you will die in your own juice. <laughs> no pain, but you just die. All this they have told me. All this the intellect has understood and remembered. And so the intellect says, don't do that, don't do that. The mind says, please, please. And the body says, come on, come on. <laughs> Think. Now, if I satisfy the, the body demand and eat it, let us say, I ate half of it. That day I have to live that day, isn't it? Now, I can't run away from my mind and intellect. They are constantly with me. During the day, let us say that I was so busy that I have no time to listen to my mind. Okay, but I had to go to bed. The moment my head hits the pillow, the mind says, why did you do it? And the intellect repeats all that, what the doctors have said, that you know, your liver is crumbling. Your kidney is stopping. Your eyesight is going. Your ears you will never be able to hear. 
you'll be a vegetable. All that because you ate it. Now the sugar has come. Gone up in your blood. And the blood. Both of them kick me. And I can't run. If anybody else is criticizing, you can do something. This is no remedy. Because it is your own mind and intellect telling you. These two start persecuting. Supposing I did not eat. Mind congratulates me. Intellect is so happy. But my body. Aren't you ashamed, Swami? Are you not a Swami? What is wrong if you eat? You will die. Stupid. What an avidya you have got, ignorance you have got. Don't you know that since you are born you have to die? Why don't you die sweetly? <laughs> <laughs> what is wrong? You should have it and should have. So, if I don't eat, body criticize. If I eat, mind and intellect together as a combination. Anyway, I get the whip. What can I do? This, I am giving one example. You know all examples. That girl, that drink, that party, anything. That house, that property. The body wants it, the mind wants it, or the intellect wants it. And then the other two say, no. The mind wants it. I hear that beautiful house. No? The intellect says, no, it's very costly. No? And the physical body says, the present house is quite all right. No? The mind, no, 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 no. You are always like that. You will never do anything that I want. I'm, 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 I'm. <laughs> you are unsympathetic. You are no woman, no imagination. If I got that house, you know, this house, what are you going to get even if you sell it? But that house, after three years, it becomes so sentimental. <laughs> that is a beautiful place and beautiful house, and therefore prices will go up, and then you can put the whole money, a million dollars in the bank, all because my advice you follow. Let us purchase that. Is it not going on? Thus, be persecuted by the BMI and the tantalizing engaging, beautiful, enchanting objects of the outer world. Hare, the poor fellow has, the individual has no peace of mind, buffeted by these two. The poor individual goes up and down, searching for a permanent happiness. When asked, the great Acharyas found that they gave the prescription, go beyond the BMI and reach the goal, the destination, the acme of evolution, the God state is all blissful, all perfect. Then he found that the people are not able to. Naturally, therefore, then the trouble started, I mean, the inquiry started. What? To kills the BMI such a might and power that they can persecute me. They belong to me, but I have no control over them at this moment. When a vehicle, these are my vehicles for me to express in the world outside. When a vehicle is not under your control, it is better not to drive, isn't it? A motorcycle or a car. If it, uh, for a single split moment, go out of your control, it's called skidding. You know the tragedy? You will wake up in the nearest hospital, along with half a dozen others. They cursing you, because they all fell into the accident because you skidded. Is it not? Skidding is a place when the a vehicle is not under your control. The vehicle by itself had decided to go to the left and then change the mind to the right. This is called skidding. 
Once again, half a dozen other buses, other cars also in, involved. You break a few bones uh, in this world at this moment. Is it not that every one of us, every moment, skiddy? None of us have any control over the equipment. So I skid on you, you skid on him, and he skid on me, and all of us skid on to another. And, and then you say that in samsara, in the world of plurality, there is no peace. So you organize a UNO to bring peace, world peace. The more they struggle to bring world peace, world becomes pieces. Why? It remains in yourself. Your self-discipline. Your ability to control your own equipment. Therefore, when they found that it's so powerful, they started inquiring, where are they getting their power to persecute me? As a result of that investigation, they discovered this factor which is represented by the letter V and it is called Vasanas. V-A-S-A-N-A. -A -A. There is no corresponding English word for it. Because in the modern psychology, they have not gone into these depths. They are only in the surface only. The conscious mind, the unconscious, subconscious mind, and recently they have accepted the unconscious mind. All these three are springing forth from the very bottom, the depth, psychological level, and that is what you call as vasana. Vasanas are inclinations that are left on you due to your past thoughts and actions. They are the habits left over, channels of thinking into which all your thoughts at any given moment is ready to flood out that direction, that which gives the direction and purpose of all your thinking personality. The vasanas determine the contours of your physical, intellectual and emotional personality. These are the tendencies gathered by each one of us as we came along the avenue of time in our march of evolution. Instead of thinking in terms of evolution, which is rather difficult for a student suddenly to remember or think, think of this life only. You and I are at this moment the product of our past. In the past, during this life, whatever we have thought of and acted, we are today channelized to repeat. It's called a habit. The smoker cannot live without smoking. The drunkard cannot live without drinking. The coffee lover cannot live without coffee. Why? These are all habits that have been formed. At that right time, all your thoughts run in that direction. You cannot but search and discover and satisfy things. These are called the tendencies. Tendencies this describe or determine our present personality and field of function. <coughs> These are unmanifest. Manifest is that which can be perceived by the body, felt by the mind, thought of by the intellect. These are all manifest. 
but this is unmanned. Just as unmanifested flies in that flowering bush in winter or in deep summer, the flowers are not there. But when the springtime comes, all the unmanifested flowers bloom forth. Similarly, these are the silent tendencies in each one of us, which manifest through us, and that is called our personality, our history, our life. Now, when the unmanifest flower in the flowering pot or flowering plant, when they manifest, the flower doesn't come out all of a sudden. And the flower opens. It's only in television, flower opens like that. In actual life, you can't see the flower opening so slow, so long. The flower emerges from the unmanifested to a manifested bloom in various stages of expression. First it becomes a bud, and then the bud slowly opens from the top, and then slowly in another two, three days time it opens up. Think? In the same way, the unmanifest in each one of you manifests into the world outside in different states. The tendency in you first expresses at the intellectual level as a desire. All of you have got desires. Don't you say that, no, Swamiji, I have no desires. If you have no desires, lie down there we will attend to your funeral as soon as this talk is over. <laughs> Only in the funeral ground or the burial ground, you can say that there is no desire in the dead body. So long as you have a manifestation, there will be desires. Why? There you are manifested because of the vasanas. The vasanas are to express. The desires will be in all of us. If three or four friends have come to your house and you are a very loving and hospitable host, came and sat down in the drawing room and the talk started at that time, my wife comes into the room. That is the fashion now. What will you have, all of you? What will you have? Because this is the five-star hotel culture. In a five-star hotel, the bearer has to come and say, yes, sir, what will you have? Isn't it? In our homes also have become five-star hotel. What will you have? So then the five of you shamelessly would say, uh, can I have some fruit juice? Yes. Can I have coffee? You don't hold coffee, I don't like it. Can you have tea? Yes. Coke. <laughs> Everyone wants different, different things. The Hindu woman is so smart. She, <laughs> a $10 million smile and she just goes in this. <laughs> <laughs> you start your discussion. International politics, which you know nothing. <laughs> Economics and finance, you know still less. You go on discussing, making noise, that is all. At that time, she comes in a tray. Another five million dollars <laughs> mine. And she went in and go to each individual 
and each individual is given a million dollars. <laughs> and the fellow looks at it and takes a glass. Everybody takes. What? No house has got all these fruit juice and then a tea, then coffee, and then somebody else wants a, a Coke. Somebody else is nothing. There is Coke and or orange, let us say. So they, they orange juice, four or five glasses, two, three glasses of uh, Coke. And you are not allowed to look at the glass because it's smiling so beautifully. <laughs> Everybody takes it because by the time they have forgotten what their desire was. They take it. Before they finish, she comes with the tray. <laughs> and everybody, <laughs> not at over. Because these are the glasses that is to be filled again to give to the next set of guests expected. Think, desires are. That is why the endless varieties that you find in the bazaars, in the supermarkets and others, is not one item, so many items of so many different types. But each individual desire is different to cater to all of them. Why is it that desires are so vast? Because the tendencies are different. When a desire rises in the intellect, the subtlest of your personality, it slowly becomes, comes to a little grosser state in the mind, and the desire of the intellect, when it expresses at the mental level, it expresses as mental agitations, weak shape, isn't it? Everybody says, I need no peace. My mind is always in a different place. Everybody's mind is. Instead of complaining that my mind is agitated, why don't you keep quiet and watch? What is the agitation about? You will find at any given moment, your agitation is only expression of the most powerful desire that you are entertaining. You want to purchase a car, your agitation will be only car, 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 car. Which car, what car, where car, why car, how car, 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 car agitation. If your desire is for coffee, 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 coffee. <laughs> your mind is not available for anything else. You may try to read something, you can't read. Coffee, 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 coffee. coffee. <laughs> You start hearing the smell of coffee, <coughs> hear the sound of cup and saucers, see not to the book that you are reading, but the coffee with fumes going up <laughs> the fragrance in the nose. Under that cloud, you have to get up from there, get the coffee wherever it is available, by fair means or foul means. <coughs> and once the coffee has come, the mind is available for anyone. Very often, you get a cup of coffee, keep it there and start your work. And you are so immersed in the work, because the mind is available, you forget that there is a coffee. Haven't you seen that after one hour or one and a half hours, you see the dead coffee sitting there? <laughs> and have you not drunk that dead coffee? Because after all, I paid for it. <laughs> that your stomach becomes the garbage can. Pour it there. Cigarette. As you are working in the typewriter, you feel cigarette. You <laughs> keep it in the ashtray and go on typing. And your typing becomes continuous until at last the whole cigarette has become one piece of ash. Have to darn it. It's not that the system wants coffee. It's not that the body wants cigarette. 
but that desire created the agitation. The agitation is satisfied because I lighted a cigarette. Then the mind is available for my work. And when I once enter into the work, the joy of work, I forget it. Until the next time the desire comes, cigarette, cigarette. Oh yes, where is my cigarette? Oh no, the whole thing is burnt up. <laughs> you light another one and keep it there. Same tragedy happens very often. That is to say, the Vasana expresses at the intellectual level as desire. desire. The desire in the intellect, when it expresses the mental level, it becomes agitation. Agitation of the mind, when fully manifest outside at the body level, are called your actions. Now the vasana for uh, breakfast. The desire has already started. <laughs> After another 20 minutes or 10 minutes, you start feeling that, what is it, the Swami is not living at all. And you don't listen to me at all. Uh, breakfast, 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 breakfast. You know. <laughs> and when I leave you, where will you go? Directly. <laughs> Every action is like that. Every action. Right? You go towards it. And that is the full expression of the vasana. So if the vasanas are good, your actions must be good. Why? Your desires will be noble, your thoughts gracious, naturally your actions saintly. Why? Your tendencies are good. If the tendencies are bad, vulgar desires, criminal thoughts, murderous activities. So when you a man, when you judge another man and say that he is a sinner, he is a dirty fellow, please, please, you don't know the mechanism. Have sympathy with him. Uh -uh. He is a product of his past. That is why Jesus so lovingly said, hate not the sinner, hate the sin. The sinner, like a patient, is helpless. But hate the disease, hate that the sin, the wrong tendency in him. But he cannot but express it. Hey. It is a fact, not only in the quality, the quality of your desire, vasanas determine the quality of your personality, but also the quantity of vasanas that you have brought with you. You are born with the vasanas, into vasanas. We discussed it in the Gita. 17th chapter, 18th chapter. The quantity may be more. So if there are more vasanas, each vasana has to come to a desire, and therefore a platoon of desires, one after another, erupting. And each desire must have agitation. So your mind is in a storm at all times. Can't even sleep without some yellow and blue pills. Why? To sleep. I can't sleep. Why can't you sleep? My mind is very dynamic. <laughs> Meaning what? Too much of agitations. Why? So much of desires. And such an individual, each of those agitations to satisfy you to undertake some project or the other. It is such people who work 18 hours a day, seven days of the week, running around the world, doing work and work and work. And people admire him that this fellow came with five dollars into this country and today he has got 20 million. 
and he has got business here, there, and he is now going to open up in Indonesia. And by 35 or 40, we hear that he is dead. Why? His body could not stand that strain. Thrombosis died. And everybody appreciates what a dynamic man. So creative. <laughs> he made so much and nobody to look after it. Everything has gone, collapsed. He himself believed. Why is he that he is working like that? You can't stop him because of his work. Thus, vasanas express as desires, desires become <laughs> agitations become activity. These actions are prompted by desires, <coughs> whipped up by the agitations. <coughs> when the vasanas are less. Less desires, therefore, less agitations, therefore, uh, less desire prompted activity. Activities need not be less because your hands and legs have got the same length. It's not that the hands have gone into the stomach. Why? Because no desires, therefore, hands got no. So you can work, but less selfish activities. Minimum vasanas, minimum desires, minimum agitations, minimum selfish work. The rest is all unselfish work. Sub Supposing you have no vasanas, ah, no desires, therefore, no agitation, therefore, not a single selfish act is not such an individual whom we adore, worship, <coughs> revere as a saint, a sage, a prophet. Did Christ function to gain anything? Did Buddha work in order to build a palace for himself? They want nothing, expect nothing, demand nothing, because they have no desire. And then they are functioning in the world outside, expressing their infinite love for the world. Hey? We adore and respect and revere him as a God-man upon earth. This is not because all the average man knows all the philosophy. Instinctively he sees a divine aura about. When the 400 million people in India calls him Mahatma Gandhi, it's not that he declared it and tried to publicize that he is divine. People started calling him. Why? They started seeing something divine about him, something adorable in him. Hey. And it is true, because when there are no vasanas, there are no desires, no agitations. Agitation desires are always regarding the world of it. When there are no desires and no agitations, the mind and intellect is activity has ended. There where the mind's activity is ended, I, who thought myself to be the perceiver, pillar, thinker, comes to awake released from the entanglement of the mind and intellect, comes to awake to realize the timeless, the permanent, the eternal, the immutable. 
in order that I may go there beyond, into my spiritual nature, my true nature, that which stands between me and the, the perfection is my own work. If vasanas are more, more extrovert. Vasanas are less, less extrovert. No vasanas, no more extrovert. You awake from this plane of consciousness of PFT into a new dimension of consciousness. Therefore, the inquiry was, what exactly or how exactly can we wipe out the, the, the what is that, oh, vasanas? How soon and how effectively can we eliminate the vasanas? So till now what I talked is the pure science, only giving you the theories of these great masters. But is it practical? How can I make it practical, useful to mankind? It means the technology. The pure science in subjective science is called philosophy. The applied science is called religion all over the world. Yoga in India. What is the yoga or the religion? What are the techniques by which I can eliminate the unnecessary vasana pressure in me? and bring my mind to quietude and contemplation and evaporate it or disseminate and release myself from the entanglements of mind and intellect and awake to the higher state of consciousness that we will take after your <laughs> extrovertedness <laughs> quietness <laughs> breakfast <laughs>